Stephen, thank you very much for the introduction. The way this is going to work is that I'm going to do the first half, and I'm Dave, not Ann. I'm going to do the first half, and then I'm going to turn it over to my co-author and wife for the second half of the talk. And what we're going to talk to you about today is essentially why healthy fertile soil is important to people from scales ranging to maintaining agricultural civilizations over the long run, and I'm a geologist, so that's kind of my world of, of expertise. And we're going to connect it also to our, each of our individual health in terms of what goes on in our gut and how our food is grown. So we're going to go from the broad down to within each one of us, and that second part is more Anne's area of expertise. So I'll turn the floor over to her for the second, for the second part. And can we turn the monitors on, please? Um, and what we're going to do is essentially talk about the, um, a series of three books that we wrote. It's what we lovingly call our Dirt Trilogy. Um, the first one I started about 10 years ago. It's a book you might expect a geologist to write about soils. It looks backwards through history and looks at what happened to societies around the world that did not take care of their soil over the long run. And so if the first part of this talk is a little bit depressing, don't worry, it's going to get a lot better by the end. That middle book, the one that Ann and I wrote together, The Hidden Half of Nature, that's our exploration of the science behind why microbial life, that the bacteria and fungi in the soil and in our gut are actually key components supporting the health and fertility of soils and also our own health and our immune systems. The third book, Growing a Revolution, takes the lessons from that first book, the science from the second book, and applies it to the problem of how we could restore soils to farming and farms around the world. It's sort of an exploration of how to translate what Anne will be telling you about into a larger scale. So, and if you if you're, uh, want to live tweet or Twitter handles on up there, feel free to connect with us at any time. But let me give the bottom line right out of the gate. What's good for the earth, it turns out, is good for us. You know, that shouldn't be a big mystery, but if we actually took that to heart, we would change an awful lot of practices in both agriculture and medicine. That's sort of the underlying theme and message, and um, that's where I will get to. But let me start with why a geologist today would be fairly concerned about the state of the world's soils. This map shows you the UN's global map of soil degradation. You'll notice there's an awful lot of orange and yellow on that map. Those are areas of degraded and very degraded agricultural soils. What does that mean? Well, very degraded agricultural soils are soils for which the loss of either the soil or the degradation of its fertility has impacted its ability to grow food for us. Now, I like to use this map to start talks like this because it does two things. One, it puts into perspective that soil degradation is a global problem. The other thing it allows me to do is to say, well, not so fast. You can look within every one of those red zones on the map and you can find farms that are actually rebuilding fertile soil at a pace that a geologist finds astounding. That's where the good news lies. So we'll get there. But first, let's go through and look at the most recent assessment of the state of the world's soils. There was a report that came out in 2015, the UN's Global State of the Soil Assessment, that argued that humanity, the collective us at a global scale, is losing 0.3% of our agricultural production capacity each and every year to ongoing soil loss and soil degradation. 0.3%, that's kind of a small number kind of what we're all getting on our savings accounts these days, I think. But at least it's a positive number, so it's not like our 401ks. Okay, that's not funny, I know. Um, the point, though, is that over the next century, we're on track to degrade another third of the world's farmland, because that 0.3%, if you multiply it out by 100 years, it's 30%. We've already degraded a third of the world's farm and cropland. We're on track to degrade another third over this century. It's my contention that agriculture is going to have to change in the 21st century because we simply can't go on raising our food in a way that will compromise the ability of future generations to keep doing so. Our population is projected to rise during this century, not go further down. We can't afford to continue degrading farmland around the world. Fortunately, there's a way to avoid that. But that's not what I wrote about in the Dirt Book. The Dirt Book is the backwards-looking book that looks at the history of civilizations. Um, and I thought it would be an, interesting to explore the history of erosion because it would be a good excuse to go visit ruins around the world and indulge some of my interest in geology. And I'm that kind of geologist 
who studies how soil erosion works naturally, how mountains are shaped, how rivers work. But in traveling around the world and viewing and working on most of the continents, I started to notice correlations that societies that had degraded their land remained impoverished centuries after their, their ancestors had done so. And I started to put the dirt book together. What I realized in studying the history of, science, of societies around the world was that soil erosion and degradation played a role in the undermining of civilizations that ranged from Mesopotamia, some of the earliest roots of, of um, agriculture in the West, to classical Greece, Rome, the southern United States, Easter Island, China, there's lots that you could actually uh, go, go through, and I do that in the dirt book. Um, but the, um, the commonality that you find in environmental history textbooks, because the idea that soil degradation, that land degradation, impacted human societies is not a new idea. I'm not claiming credit for that as a new idea. It's been written about for a long time, actually. It hasn't been acted on a whole lot, but the story that you find in different societies around the world is actually surprisingly similar. You find the stories of um, degradation that impacted societies. The culprit that you usually find in environmental history textbooks, though, is that deforestation led to soil loss that undermined societies. And I realized in researching this book that that actually wasn't correct. It wasn't the ax, but it was the plow that followed that set soil degradation on course to actually impact whole regions around the world. So what is it about the plow that actually led to soil degradation? Well, the invention of the plow fundamentally altered the balance of soil erosion and soil production at the surface of the earth. And if you think about the soil the way a geologist thinks about soil, as, a, as something that can be made, as something that can be lost, how do you make soil? It's from the combination of the mineral matter and rocks, the kind of geology that I work on, and biology, the kind of stuff that Anne works on. It's that combination of geology and biology, of mineral matter and organic matter and, and plants and the microbes in the soil that make healthy, living, fertile, productive soil. What does a plow do to that? Well, a plow is intended to turn the soil upside down. It's exceptionally good weed control. We all kind of know this, and that's one of the reasons it was very uh, widely adopted in agriculture for centuries. But what it also does is it leaves the soil bare and vulnerable to erosion by wind or rain, for some part of the year, until the next either weeds come in or the next crop comes in. And if you get a good storm at a time when the land is bare, you can erode off an awful lot of soil. And if you think about soil as that system, much like your bank account, we all have income and we have expenses. And in the soil, our income is building soil from mixing rocks and organic matter. Our expenses are soil erosion. And the standing crop of soil on a landscape, you can think of as the natural capital that finances agricultural civilizations. And in the same way that if we spend more money faster than we make money, we're depleting our savings. And I know this as, an, as a, for sure, that if you spend money faster than you make it for long enough, you can completely burn through your savings, because I've done it a few times. Soil is no different at a societal level. Now this slide of um, the Palouse region in eastern Washington it's sort of a hilly country that has beautiful agricultural soils, um, but this slide of a winter wheat field illustrates why a geologist like myself would look at plow-based agriculture and see it as a slow motion disaster. Because look at all those little channels that are cut into that hillside. We call those rills. You could erase them with a single pass of the plow. But notice there's no plants on that wheat field. This is a kind of a system that was a wheat fallow rotation. So you'd grow wheat, then you'd let it, you'd plow it up and you'd let it sit bare for a season. If you got rain when it wasn't covered with plants, you'd get erosion like this. It's an agronomic nuisance. With a plow, you can basically erase all those little channels, but they add up over time. How big a, uh, an effect can it make over time? Well, this next slide is also from the Palouse region. And I like to talk about the Palouse because I'm from Washington State, Anne and I live in Seattle, as she'll be going into a little bit more later. And I find it's generally safer to pick on your own home state when you travel. But the Palouse is an area, it's very rich agricultural land. When this, when this field was, was first plowed back in um, 1911, this fence up there is a fence that encircles the farmer's water supply, a water cistern. And you know, it's not good to plow over your own water supply. So they built a fence around it, and nothing's happened on this field for the next 50 years, because the photograph was taken in 1961. Uh, nothing's happened other than it was that wheat fallow rotation, 
And some years, the rain would come when the land was bare. Those little rills would be uh, carved into the landscape. And if you plow in the same direction every year on a sloping hill, you're moving soil downhill progressively. So what happened is you created this cliff over the course of 50 years. And how high is that cliff? That's about a five foot high cliff. Think about that for a minute. Five feet of soil loss in 50 years. That's about a foot every decade. That's about an inch a year. There's nowhere on earth that soil forms at that pace, except my wife's garden and some farms that I visited. But nature doesn't build soil that fast. The good news when we get a little later is that we can do it, and we can do it in ways that can actually help and benefit our own health. Um, but I also hope you're sitting there going, isn't that a pretty extreme example? And of course it is, that's why I use it. It's the most extreme example I could find. You should be sitting there going, how typical is it? How does this paint across a whole landscape? How, what, what's the number globally, for example? Well, let me, I'm not gonna walk you through every civilization that I talked about in the dirt book, because I'd be here talking till midnight, and then I'd be up, you know, get in trouble for burning ants half of the talk up. But this shows you the magnitude of historical soil erosion, soil erosion in the Piedmont region, the hill country from Virginia down there to Alabama on the southeastern seaboard of the United States, an area that was one of the bread baskets of the early uh, colonies, and uh, early European colonies in North America. And you'll notice that gray corresponds to four to 10 inches of soil loss over the last two to 300 years. Now, how big a deal is that? Well, if you go back and you read the journals of some of the original farmers and plantation owners that, worked, that first worked this land for agriculture, uh, for Western agriculture, that is, um, there was only about six to 12 inches of rich black earth over the subsoil. The fertility of the land is held in the topsoil, not the subsoil. One of the problems with erosion is if you shave it off the top, you're losing the best stuff first. So if we could erode off a third to virtually all of the topsoil across a region that was one of the breadbaskets of the early American colonies, and we could do it in just a few hundred years. Think what the Greeks could have done a thousand year run at, at southern Greece. Think what the Romans could have done with an 800 year run at central Italy, with much the same technology of plow-based agriculture. Has anyone ever in here ever been to the, the ancient port of Rome, Ostia? How, it, can you see the ocean from there? It's inland. It's miles inland. You don't build harbors inland. What happened is the soils of central Italy washed off, pushed the coast out, formed the famous Pontine Marshes. Um, the example from the southern United States illustrates that the idea that soil loss can impact societies in ways that can undercut their future viability, um, it makes, and that they did this in regions around the world, not sound like the crazy, crazy ravings from a, of a professor from Seattle. It actually pencils out, um, and it is a very important problem. What we've done, well this shows you the soil, in that gray noodle in a part of North Carolina that I went to and visited as part of an episode of the TV program Nova, and the monitors just died again. Um, uh, the, the TV program Nova, um, where they're trying to illustrate the, mag the history of soil in the United States. And what I like about this photograph is it basically shows in a nutshell what we've done with agriculture over the last few centuries. The soil on the left, hopefully you can see that it's darker than the soil on the right. Uh, this stuff on the right is from a conventional tobacco plantation that's had about 100 years of um, agrochemical inten agrochemically intensive agriculture, and it looks like khaki beach sand. And it looks that way for a very good reason. You can basically pick this similar kind of stuff up on the California beach, right out of the sea. There's no organic matter in it. There's hardly any life in it. Um, it's, and it looks like beach sand because it is beach sand. It's 10 million year old beach sand. What it's lacking is not the geology for fertile soil, it's lacking the biology, it's lacking the life. The soil on the left, that's soil from a forest immediately surrounding that tobacco field that was a farm up until about 120 years ago and then was abandoned and let go back to the forest. And nature rebuilt the soil, did it slowly, but it turned it into this sort of milk chocolate color. The difference between the khaki and the milk chocolate is carbon, soil organic matter, the remains of once living organisms. Um, that's the difference between fertility and, and land that you really need to chemically supplement to maintain high yields. If you add a whole lot of chemical fertilizers to really rich, fertile soil with a lot of organic matter, you don't get much in the way of a fertility boost. It's part of why 
fertilizers became popular in the 20th century is that we'd already degraded the fields of Europe and Eastern North America. So how, what have we done across North America in terms of, of uh, soil fertility and the organic matter in soils? The amount of carbon that was held in soils? This study from 2015 <coughs> basically argued that the soil organic matter, SOM is soil organic matter content, of the agricultural soils across North America has dropped by 50%, by half, since the dawn of colonial agriculture. Now this illustrates that you know, part of the problem with soil degradation is the loss of the soil itself, Part of the problem is running the batteries down that drive the microbial processes that Anne will tell you about in more detail in a few minutes, but that really are the underpinnings of soil fertility. Because all that carbon in the soil, all that organic matter, is food for microbes. And they turn out to be an essential link in the cycling of nutrients that allow us to farm and farm sustainably. Now I also want to point out this is not simply a North American problem. How many of you had coffee this morning? All right, well, this picture is from the heart of coffee country down in Costa Rica. It's from near the Continental Divide down there. And basically what it shows you on the left is the soil that you have in the jungle, in the native forest. It actually has, my notebook is sitting there sort of at the boundary between the topsoil and the subsoil. The subsoil is kind of reddish. Technically, it's called an oxisol, the soil that you would have in this area. It's very oxidized, and you can think of it as it's basically weathered and kind of rusty. The topsoil is, is black and rich and beautiful. You go into the coffee plantation on the same hillside further down, where it's been um, a farm for about 100 years now conventionally, it's subsoil to the surface. There's no topsoil anymore, and they did it in just 100 years. The farmers growing coffee in the soils that have no longer have a subsoil have horrible blight problems, have real, um, <coughs> something called Rioja that is impacting their, 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 their crops. Healthy, fertile soil translates into resilience on parts of the plants. And again, we'll get to explaining how that works. But first, I want to get back to that question that I was asking. When I showed you that fence line and that extreme case of soil erosion, I was asking myself, how typical is that example? So I did something in terms of trying to figure that out, I went to the library and I vacuumed up all the data I could find about how fast are the world's soils eroding and how fast does nature build soils. And I literally found hundreds of papers, scientific papers out of the peer-reviewed literature that I gathered those data from and I compiled global averages. At the top, how fast is soil eroding from the world's farmland? Well, the global average is about, you know, and this is plowed farmland, conventionally tilled farmland. And the average rate's about a millimeter and a half a year. Now, a millimeter and a half a year, that's not a very fast rate, is it? It's kind of hard to watch something evolve over that. Your fingernails grow 10 times faster than that. The San Andreas Fault moves 10 times faster than that. And then, all, and then causes all kinds of problems when it does. Um, but that means that it would take less than 20 years to erode an inch of soil off of tilled farm fields, on average globally. Results on your farm or your yard may vary. But compare that to how fast nature makes soil. A pace of about 2% of a millimeter a year. That's even slower. That's really hard to figure out even how to measure. But it also means that it takes more than 1,000 years for nature to make an inch of soil on average. The problem, of course, lies in the difference between those numbers. We've been eroding off the fertile skin of the earth the soil that I'm sure Vandana Shiva will be talking more about later in the week. We've been eroding it off orders of magnitude faster than it replaces itself. We've been spending the natural capital that future generations will need to feed themselves. There's, sort of, there's no way, sort of way around that simple math. And in writing the dirt book, I wrestled with the idea of, well, what does this mean for the maintenance of agricultural societies over the long run? And I've kind of given you the, all the data that it would take to calculate for yourself the average longevity of an agricultural civilization. Because if we're eroding soils at about a millimeter a year or faster than they're being replaced, and that's conservative. I could have argued for a millimeter and a half. But let's just give me a millimeter a year in terms of an average loss of soil. And you could erode off the typical hillside soil in most parts of the world in less than 1,000 years. One of the things I realized and you know, researching the societies around the world that I wrote about in the dirt book, was that that's approximately the lifespan of most agricultural civilizations. But there's some big exceptions that I hope you're sitting there thinking about. What about Egypt? 
and the Nile. They've farmed it for thousands of years. What about the rivers of India, the Indus and the Brahmaputra that they've farmed for thousands of years? <laughs> what about the rivers of lowland China? The Tigris and the Euphrates? Those places where people have farmed using conventional tillage for thousands of years all occupy major river floodplains. What happens on a floodplain? It floods. And do floods bring clean water? No. Floods bring the soil from upstream. They bring the dirt from your neighbor's farm. They bring tires or whatever got into the river. <coughs> Most rivers naturally flood on average about once a year. And they don't flood very deeply. They just overtop their banks. But recall that one millimeter a year erosion rate off of the world's farmlands. How thick is a grain of sand? Well, it's about a millimeter. Two millimeters is coarse sand. One millimeter is medium sand. In other words, if you're farming on a floodplain and it's allowed to flood, nature will bring you new soil at about the, plate, the pace that you may be losing it from the plow. That's how societies farmed on major river floodplains for thousands of years. But when farming spread up onto the hillsides, that's when the clock started ticking on the ability to maintain farming practices on, soil, on landscapes where the soils eroded. That's sort of the, the guts of the dirt book. And I promised that the first part of the talk might be a bit depressing. We're through that part now. Because what I wanted to shift to is the question that I started asking myself, that I really wrestled with in writing the last chapter of that book, is soil restoration possible? Could we actually reverse the historical pattern of land degradation that limited the longevity of many societies around the world? And I'm not arguing that soil erosion killed off societies. What I'm arguing is that soil erosion undermined their vitality, their resilience. It helped contribute to their demise. Um, and the question, of course, is are we doomed to repeat that at a global scale, or do we have different options? Can we actually farm intensively in ways that will, will allow us to rebuild the health and fertility of our land and manage to feed ourselves at the same time? And I'm happy to say that I've become much more of an optimist. The story really starts with what Ann is going to be telling you about in our observations in our own yard. But I'm going to skip ahead and talk about the third book in our Dirt Trilogy, Growing a Revolution, because that's the book where I tried to answer the question of could we actually rebuild healthy, fertile soils at scale on fully operational, profitable farms? Because for any style of farming to be sustainable, first of all, it has to be profitable and sustainable for the farmers, or it won't be sustained. Um, and what I did is I took six months off from my job at the University of Washington, and I traveled around the world visiting farmers who had already restored health and fertility to their land. I did that thing that is kind of, I guess, unusual for many academics. I went and I listened to people. And I asked the farmers that I visited, what did you do? Give me a shovel. Let's dig holes in your field. Let's dig holes in your neighbor's field. Show me your soil and tell me your processes, how you got there. And I went to Equatorial Africa, I went to Central America, I went across North America, and then I finally ran out of a travel budget and I had to stop and write the book up. Um, and what I found is that the common denominator between the farmers that I visited around the world who had already, who had already demonstrated that they could take degraded, worn out land and turn it into really fertile and profitably farmed land, who had done the opposite of what I showed you at that North Carolina tobacco plantation people who had fixed their soil and done it at a pace a geologist considers remarkably fast, the three principles they all had in common were the ones up on the screen now. They didn't disturb their soil much, which meant they were doing things like no-till agriculture. They were not plowing anymore. They also maintained a permanent ground cover. So they were planting cover crops. They were keeping the ground covered with a living plant at all times. They were not doing what I showed you the farmers in the Palouse were doing. These people would plant cover crops in between their cash crops, or even in and amongst their cash crops, depending on where in the world they were and their style of farming. And they also planted diverse crop rotations. They were not just growing one or two crops. And all those little microbes up on the screen around there are there to remind me to basically say that if you were to imagine a system to try and cultivate the beneficial organisms in the soil, this is how you would do it. You wouldn't disturb them. Imagine if somebody took the roof off of your house once a year and stirred all your belongings up. You'd move pretty fast, right? My guess is like once would be enough and we'd be out of there. Well, Mike, you know, doing a plow does that to microbial life in the soil. Imagine being a worm in the soil and a plow coming through. It's, it's, it's a disaster. 
Um, maintaining a permanent ground cover, these cover crops, that's a way to introduce carbon into the soil. It's a way to feed the soil with organic matter because you're not exporting it. You basically kill the cover crops off, they rot, and what you've done with the cover crops is taken mineral elements out of the soil, get them into the plant, you then kill that plant off. As that plant rots, the microbes in the soil make that material available to the plant. You're fertilizing your next cash crop with your cover crops. And diverse crop rotations, the diversity is a way to get in a multiplicity of, of functions. Imagine how dysfunctional a village would be if all you had was auto mechanics or geologists. It wouldn't be a terribly diverse community um, and productive. Those general principles translated to all the settings I visited around the world. That minimal disturbance, the cover crops, and the diverse rotations. But the specific practices that farmers used in different parts of the world were totally different. They had to figure out how to adapt those broad principles to their setting, to their technological level, to their technologies, to their economies, sometimes even to their, their political and social systems, but to their soil and to their crops. Soils are one of the most diverse natural resources we have. There's something like 300,000 different named types of soils in the world. And it might be 200,000. The point is, it's a huge number of different kinds of soils. Even on one farm, you'll have different areas that could behave differently. The farmers I visited who had applied these principles and figured it out had done so through a lot of trial and error and tinkering and figuring out how to make a new system of thinking work. Because if you look at those three principles, the minimal disturbance, the cover crops, and the diversity of crops, they are the 180 degree opposite of what we've been teaching in agronomy for the last 100 years, in teaching tillage intensive, chemical intensive monocultures. This is a new way of thinking about the soil. It's not necessarily so much about organic versus conventional practices as it is about thinking differently about how to deal with the soil and tailoring practices to cultivating the life that benefits one's crops. The kind of people I visited were people uh, like these, uh, Dwayne Beck at Dakota Lakes Research Farm. I'm going to spare you all the details I go into in growing our evolution on these guys, but Dwayne was working with farmers up to 20,000 square uh, acres, 20,000 acres, big farms in the Dakotas, Think, you know, horizon to horizon type farms, large scale commercial industrialized farms. They were figuring out how to apply these principles of dealing with um, no-till cover crops and uh, diversity in the crops. And what they'd done is they'd managed to slash their diesel, fertilizer, and pesticide use by more than half. Those are the three big expenses in modern conventional farming. So they were growing just as much, spending less to do it, they were profitable. That's what helped it catch on. When I left his farm, I asked him whether the ideas that he was using would actually work for subsistence farmers in Africa. And he said, don't ask me, I'm not a subsistence farmer in Africa. Go ask this gentleman here, Kofi Boa. He, he runs the No-Till Center for Research in Kumasi, Ghana, and he's done an amazing thing teaching people in, uh, in and around his, his village to go to No-Till with a diversity of crops. They're, using, they're managing small farms. This room would be a, a reasonably sized farm for around his village. But what he did is he taught people by thinking about the soil differently, they were able to double and triple their crop yields without using fertilizers, without using pesticides, without using patented seeds. They did it by changing the way they think about the soil and it transformed the economy of their region. Gabe Brown and David Brandt, the two gentlemen uh, uh, pictured here, are two North American farmers that I visited. Gabe basically taught me that the value of bringing livestock into farming operations in terms of their ability to manure the soil and actually rebuild fertility. A lot of the problems with livestock management isn't so much the cows, it's how we manage the cows. You put all the cows in a confined feeding operation, you turn their manure into a waste product. You let them manure the fields like Gabe has done and he's actually been restoring native prairie using cows as his primary tool. It's about how you manage the cows. Uh, David Brandt there is holding up one of his tillage radishes. Uh, he sells corn, soybeans, and wheat into the North American commodity markets. Um, he's a conventional farmer, but he has some unconventional ideas. He views himself as a bit of a microbe rancher. He grows diverse cover crops to feed the microbes in his soil. And you'll notice the field behind him is sort of yellowish. That's his neighbor's soybean field. All the green stuff that you can see on that screen, those are glyphosate-resistant weeds. They've been sprayed three times that year. You cannot kill them. They depress the yield that those farmers get. They have an economic impact. Notice David's field is nice and green. It's 
got a lot of cover crops in it. David doesn't have weeds in his fields. He plants them. He calls them cover crops. He turns nature to working for him instead of trying to fight nature. And it works out very well for him. In fact, it works out to the degree, and the reason that it works out very well, in fact, he sort of bought his neighbor's farm recently since I visited. How is he so much more profitable than his neighbor's? Because he's spending very little on inputs, and he's harvesting more than they are. He's making more, he's more profitable. And this is why. This is his soil. This is the soil he had in 2014 when I visited. Uh, this is the soil he had back in 1971. This is actually from his neighbor's farm, uh, but it is very much like what he had in 1971. You know, less than 2% organic matter. This one has, you know, three times that or so. He rebuilt the fertility of his land, and he's harvesting the benefit. This land degradation problem can be reversed. This is a photo from Gabe Brown's farm showing the, the animals that he brings back in after to graze off his cover crop. So he'll plant a cash crop, then plant a cover crop, then he brings the livestock in to graze the cover crop. And what the livestock are doing is they're basically functioning as four-legged, mobile, self-propelled methane digesters <coughs> that consume the crop stubble, excrete it as manure, and that manure is rich in all the nutrients it takes to grow new plants. So he, he's using the livestock to accelerate the cycling of nutrients in the soil, and that allows him not only to grow his crops, but also to sell eggs and to sell meat. What's that done to his soil? This is Gabe's hand with the soil on that very piece of ground I was just showing you. Uh, it's rich, black earth. This is his neighbor's organic farm. Which looks more fertile? Which has healthier soil? Now, I started teasing Gabe and David Brandt and calling them organic-ish farmers because they had so reduced their need or reliance on chemical inputs. And I think Gabe is actually now completely off of them, if I recall correctly. Um, and we have a huge opportunity in conventional agriculture to try and transform conventional practices into these organic-ish practices. And we also have an opportunity in organic agriculture to try and get at, well, why does the organic field have less carbon in it? Because they plow so much. There's other ways to think about managing weeds than the plow. We have, it's a challenge to figure out how to do it in an organic system. But challenges are what you know, human ingenuity was designed to go up against and figure ways around. Um, and these guys that I've just been sharing with you are people that were inspirational to both Ann and I in terms of thinking about uh, how to think about the problem of reversing the historical problem of soil degradation that's plagued societies around the world. And it led Ann and I to think about um, the diet of plants. And I'll admit, as a geologist, I was never trained to think about plants having a diet. It was kind of an odd idea for me, but I, I, I think it's actually pretty apt now. And we, we discuss in The Hidden Half of Nature um, the difference between a fertilizer diet and what we call a soil health diet. Because on a fertilizer diet, you can grow big crops that have high yields in really poor degraded soil if you add enough of the major elements that the plants need for growth. This is the story of agriculture in the second half of the 20th century, after all. But what about the health of the plants? If you actually look at what happens to a plant that you feed a lot of the major elements it needs for growth, it turns into what Ann and I call couch potato crops. They stop investing so much in their root system. This has consequences that Ann is going to elaborate on in a few minutes. Um, but those plants will get less in the way of mineral micronutrients, less in the way of beneficial microbial metabolites that bolster plant health. In contrast, plants grown in healthy fertile soil, organic matter rich soil, full of life. They don't need as much external supplement in terms of the major elements and they get more mineral micronutrients, which means more mineral micronutrients in our food, and they also get more beneficial metabolites, and the plants are stimulated to make more secondary plant metabolites, which turn out to be something called phytochemicals, which are good for us. So I summarized um, in Growing a Revolution uh, the recipe for healthy, fertile soil. Ann and I sort of conspired to think up, you know, sort of a nice short tagline for the book. What we came up with ditch the plow, cover up, and grow diversity. That's the recipe for taking intensive agriculture and moving it from a style that degrades the land into a style that can improve the land. And you can argue, and I think quite compellingly, that if you want to accelerate this, you could think about reintegrating livestock, animal husbandry, and cropping. There was a paper that we found in Research and Growing a Revolution that um, went through the math on if we took all the livestock and the CAFOs around the country and we redistributed them on farms, 
they would produce enough manure that you could actually replace 90% of the nitrogen fertilizer that we use on corn and not move any cow outside of the county it already resides in. That would be pretty amazing. We split animal husbandry and cropping back in the mid 20th century. Some of the people I've been visiting have been experimenting with reintegrating them. The kind of benefits that could result from rebuilding healthy fertile soils, well, it's more profitable for the farmers. That's incredibly important for making it work and stick. It can, reduce, it can result in comparable crop yields. That's important for feeding the world, but it also allows us to do that with less fossil fuel, less fertilizer, and less pesticides. <coughs> Whether or not one goes organic or organic-ish, this is a benefit. It also allows us to put carbon in the soil. All the differences between those khaki and those dark soils, that's carbon. <coughs> it also results in better water retention, less pollution on the landscape, and I'm arguing that we're poised for what I hope will be a fifth agricultural revolution, one rooted in the concepts of soil health. <coughs> We've gone through a series of four agricultural revolutions, and I think we're poised for a fifth one. If you're curious about the other four, well, I talk about that in Growing Revolution. I'm more interested in the future that I think we can use to reshape agriculture. But there's one other reason that we ought to be thinking about this stuff. The soil is where our food comes from. <coughs> 97% of our food comes from the soil. Thank you very much. If only it was scotch. <laughs> ah, excellent. 97% um, of our food comes from the soil. It's where our food comes from. What does all this stuff mean for us? Well, this also is not a new idea. There's a wonderful book that came out in 1943 by Lady Eve Balfour, who is an English agronomist who collaborated with, with medical doctors in England, and who wrote a book called The Living Soil, in which she argued that poor soil health resulted in sick crops and sick farm animals, which led to sick people. She was kind of ahead of her time, because in her day, we didn't know as much about the microbial roots of life and health that Anne's going to be talking to you about. And yet, if you read it today, her book today, it's still incredibly insightful. It's a very interesting read. And if these, if these connections are true, then one of the other reasons we should be thinking about restoring health and fertility to the world's soils is our own health. How does that work? Well, there's pretty, pretty well documented declines in the mineral abundance in fruits and vegetables and, and other foods, meat and dairy as well, uh, in the, over the course of the 20th century, um, with you know, one example sort of shown up here where you're dealing with not small reductions in some of the essential mineral micronutrients that we need for health. Not so much what we need for growth, but what we need for health. And a question relates to how we could actually reverse that. And what about the phytochemicals, the secondary plant metabolites, compounds that are known to be very important for human health. Um, linalool is in lavender, um, sulforaphane is in Nebraska, it has cancer-fighting properties, uh, curcumin is in turmeric, these are compounds that plants make in response to external stimulus and that agronomic practices can actually affect their abundance in our crops and in our foods. Well, how much so? A lot of the best work on this we can find is, is done overseas. But in most of the comparisons of sort of the nutri nutritive value of organic versus conventional foods, which there's always sort of a back and forth about which is better in the popular press, because whatever you find, you can spin an argument around. The thing that's almost always found in these studies that doesn't get the press it deserves is the differences in the phytochemicals. Why aren't those talked about? They're not considered nutrients. They're important for health, but they're not nutrients. I don't understand that, but be that as it may, um, these studies almost always show that, uh, like in this one, uh, the, the physiochem physiochemical and nutritional properties relating to the contents of vitamins, phenolics, and antioxidants, phytochemicals, are higher in organically produced fruits. Same is true for many vegetables. In other words, you can start looking at reasons to think that healthy soil would translate into healthier crops and farm animals. Does that translate into healthier people? That's the book that Anne and I are trying to start working on now, that hopefully in about a year or two we'll have fleshed out. Um, what we've done so far, other than sort of trying to figure out how to frame it, um, is we did, took advantage of one experiment that a farmer did in um, Northern Oregon. And this slide violates all the rules of PowerPoint, right? You know, way too much text, whole bunch of numbers. What it basically shows you, though, is a really neat experiment. This farmer took two fields um, that were direct seeded, so there were no-till, one had cover crops, 
and the other was conventional, by which he means sprayed with glyphosate to manage the weeds. So you've got two fields side by side, same soil, same climate, he grew the same crop <coughs> for two years running, and what we did is that Ann and I got samples of his wheat, we crushed them up, we ran them through the mass spec at the University of Washington. These are the different mineral elements over there on the left, and you can see basically the values in parts per million of the cover crop, parts per million of the conventional field. The key thing is look at the ratio on the right. It's the, it's the column on the right is the ratio between those two, and I've just highlighted in green zinc. It's a mineral micronutrient that's really essential for our health. 56% more in the cover cropped crop. You can't change the soil that fast. Same amount of zinc is in the soil in both fields. You're getting more of it in the crop than the one that had the cover crops. And if you're curious about how that works, well, that's where I need to turn things over to Ann to tell you about. But the bottom line is if we think about farming practices that are actually good for building the soil, that are good for building the fertility of the soil, we think they're actually good for us too. And we think there's pretty solid evidence sitting, um, hiding out there in plain sight around that. So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Anne, and she's going to tell you more about the microbial part of the equation. All right, thank you very much for your attention and your interest. Soil, to us, is a very sexy topic, but it's not necessarily for everybody else, so um, I'm really heartened to see everybody here. So <clears throat> the hidden half of nature was, um, was really sort of a journey for us in many ways. And oddly enough, it was a journey where we didn't really go anywhere in a sense. We went to lots of places in our mind, but um, we didn't, this was not a book that we traveled around for, except, um, thank you. We didn't really travel around, except we went to the backyard, and that is where we met our protagonists. Now, I imagine that you're familiar with a lot of the things up here. These are all of the microorganisms, common types of microorganisms. And people sometimes ask, uh, what really is a microorganism? I'm going to give you a really simple definition, and it is this. A microorganism is a single-celled life form. And single-celled means tiny, they're very difficult to see, so they're invisible to us. But yet, they are there. They are there in the soil, and as I hope I can convince you, they are also in our bodies. The only one that's a little odd here is people say, fungi? Why is that? I thought a, a mushroom? Well, actually, yeast are kind of fungi, and they are a single-celled organism. And also, over here is archaea. The archaea... Mean, archaea means ancient one, and for a long time, microbiologists thought, eh, that's just a bacterium. You know, moves like one, looks like one, and then they did genomic analysis, and archaea are completely different. So, nonetheless, this is, this is the microbial world, and this is who we met along the way in our journey. Now, I need to tell you a little something about myself. In addition to being a biologist, I have a bad case of plant lust, okay? I was a wannabe gardener when we first bought our house in Seattle. I'd, I'd kicked around with doing gardening in college and so on, but finally, a bigger piece of ground to work with. And we, we did sort of the opposite of what's going on in Seattle today. We cleared everything off of the lot except for the house. And that's when I discovered my dream dirt. No. Look at this stuff. This is dirt that was dashing my dreams. This made me not just unhappy, but it sent me into a panic, OK? Um, one thing to keep in mind is just the, that roof line. It's going to come back later in a couple of shots. And this is the beginning of what I call my organic matter chronicles. This was the beginning of my education as a gardener, and I thought, OK, I've done enough gardening and I know enough biology that I need to start getting some organic matter into the soil. And the first thing I started with was to paint up my wheelbarrow. OK, very important. You must put flames on the wheelbarrow. But if I were to do this today, 
Having done all the research and writing for the hidden half of nature, I should really have microbes painted on this wheelbarrow. This is kind of a fossil fuel intensive theme, but we all get what it means, right? So next wheelbarrow is getting microbes on it. Painted it up, and then I started collecting organic matter as close to home and as cheaply as possible. And I imagine there's um, a few gardeners out there, and if there are these, you can read up here what these different piles are. N is just means a nitrogen source. Carbon refers to, um, C refers to a carbon source. And so these were the things that I kept collecting. And we have something kind of neat in uh, Seattle, and it's Zoodoo. Now, I can't be Gabe Brown. I can't be bringing cows home and things like that. I mean, as it was, Dave was a little alarmed at some of the things I was doing because I would load the car up with tons of coffee grounds and bring it home and say, look, coffee grounds. And he looked and said, what are you doing? And I said, you just wait and see, because I think this is going to make a difference. Zudu is the composted manure of uh, giraffes and elephants and the other herbivores at the Seattle Zoo. So if you're lucky enough, you have to put a card in for a lottery. And if your card is picked, you get to go get Zudu. So this is how I was getting some animal manure into the garden. And these are just some other items um, in my mulch mixes. I would take all of this stuff, I would mix it up in the barrow, and this is a more of a summertime mulch. You can see a lot of fresh green matter in there. You can see the neighbor's bouquet. I thanked her, and then I said, we have these inside for a few days, and then boom, into the mulch mix they go. And what a lot of people think when it comes to gardening is, oh, geez, i got to dig all that stuff in. No, 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 no. Remember what Dave said? The more you dig in the soil, it's like pulling the roof off of this place and stirring. And that is scrambling and maiming and killing the life of the soil. So not only did I, did I not want to do that, I had done enough gardening, and I bet there's some people out there too, that trying to dig things into the soil can be very backbreaking. It is a lot of labor. And we were kind of under the gun here. This was August. Even in Seattle, it can get very hot. And I was, you know, like I said, freaked out about that soil that we started with. So I layered these mulch mixes about this high, sorry, about this high on all the beds. And the funny thing about it is I, I started doing this the first summer, and it has continued on, and it has never really ended. And there was a question about this, my mulch mixes, that was... In, in some ways, the start of the hidden half of nature, because where is all of this stuff going? Why am I constantly collecting organic matter, mixing it up in the barrel, laying it out, and thinking I'm done? Where is this stuff going? And I'll answer that question in a minute, but here is, after several seasons, you can see that horrible soil that we started with. And then this is the new soil that's slowly accumulating beneath one of my um, layers of mulch. So when you think about building soil, it's not really from the ground up. It's kind of from the top down. And we, I, I did this, this was, I started to see difference as, differences in the color of the soil after a couple of years. Very thin, thin, dark layers started to form. This is probably six or seven years um, after doing all of the mulching. And so if you think about the rate at which the soil is being improved and made here versus the slide that Dave showed you of nature's rate of um, an inch about every thousand years, this is, there's not many things we can do better than Mother Nature, but making soil through adding organic matter, I would posit, is one of those things, actually. Okay. So there you can see on the left what we started with and on the right pretty much where our soil is now. And carbon content wise, sort of on average across the yard when we started, it was somewhere around 1 or 2%. And now it's as high as around 10, 12% in the veggie bed and in the regular ornamental beds and beneath our eco lawn, it's somewhere around 7 or 8%. So imagine if every gardener on this planet and in this country started stashing organic matter 
into mulches, and that's breaking down, and it's taking all of that excess carbon up in the atmosphere, and it's pulling it down to Earth, and it's binding it up and keeping it in some form of life. So this, is a, this could be a big help um, on, the, on the climate change front. All right, so if that's going on below ground, this is what we have above ground. There's that roof line again. Dave talks about the farmers and their crops are soybeans or corn or tillage radishes. My crops are maple trees and flowers and vines. And it's still amazing me, uh, to me to think that this came out of what we started with, all that dead dirt. And also, of course, a veggie, a veggie bed is often a garden within a garden. And the veggie bed gets all of my special attention and a lot of my really nice organic matter. Um, I have a, a worm bin that our food scraps go in. And that is choice, choice stuff. And that's what the veggie bed gets. All right. so. I did a lot of labor. I did a lot of work. Dave helped. I would, I would um, enlist him in certain tasks, and he was always a good sport. And so we thought, gosh, we've done all this heavy lifting. I brought tons and tons of organic matter home. But there was heavier lifting going on beneath our feet, quite, quite literally. We're all familiar with sort of these macro life forms in the soil, like this earthworm. But something that most people probably are less familiar with is the microbes. So our chewers and chompers, earthworms and others, they start the initial deconstruction of organic matter, and it gets it down to a size that eventually a tiny, tiny um, microbe can deal with. And so this is a clump of bacteria right here. Uh, and this large green thing, this is a root hair, even tinier than a root. And these diffuse shapes around the root are one of those kinds of microbes. It's a, a mycorrhizal fungi that is surrounding that root. And I want to focus on, I want to keep it with the microbes. These also are, are barely, th this guy you can see, it's a very small microarthropod. This is a nematode. And what's interesting about things slightly larger than the mycorrhizal fungi and the bacteria is they get eaten, right? Life in the soil is an eat or be eaten kind of proposition. And these nematodes are hoovering up bacteria like crazy. Bacteria happen to be, their little tiny one-celled bodies happen to be quite rich in nitrogen. Nitrogen is one of the three main things that a plant needs to grow. And the beauty of this system is that a microbe dies, it becomes a little tiny nitrogen packet. This nematode, is also pooping out microbes. And that manure of that nematode is also very rich in nitrogen. So it's putting the nitrogen right in the zone of the roots where they need it. I'm not running off to the nursery to buy bags of fertilizer. I'm letting nature do it for me, but I need to be feeding these microbes with the organic matter. And one one thing about the, microbe, the microbial communities in the soil is that in addition to the organic matter, they are also feasting on other things called uh, exudates. And exudate, just think about that word for a minute. Embedded in that word is exude, along with, if you think of something exuding, think oozing, thinking flowing, not in a bad way, but in a very good way because these exudates flow out of the roots of plants into a place called the rhizosphere. And that is, if you picture a halo-like zone, very, very close to the root, all around that root system, that is what is called the rhizosphere. And that is the area that these exudates are flowing into. And it's estimated that a plant will take use about 40% of the energy it obtains through photosynthesis, and it uses that energy to manufacture these exudates. And these exudates, you're thinking, God, what is she talking? What is flowing out of these roots anyway? Food. Proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. And here are the microbes sitting there in the rhizosphere, lapping it up like dogs eating their dinner. And 
why, why would all of this be happening? For some very interesting reasons. It's really a biological bazaar down there in the rhizosphere. And what you have is exudates coming out, and you've got bacteria primarily right around that root, and fungi as well. They're eating that, and microbes themselves, we all have waste products. I've heard there's been a lot of talk at the conference about toxins and digestion and poop and all of that kind of stuff. Microbes do it too, but in the case of the soil and the rhizosphere, we need to get this notion of waste product out of our minds because these microbial metabolites that, that are uh, coming out of the soil microorganisms are things like plant growth promoting hormones. So the plant, in many cases, is relying on a bacterium to make the hormones that the plant needs to grow. So this is very, very unusual. In addition, uh, plants, plants will also rely on microbes for information about what's happening in the soil. Say there's a pathogen coming at the plant root. The root microbiome can tell the plant, hey, you've got fusarium wilt coming at us. You've got verticillium wilt coming at us you better start beefing up your plant immune system. So there is a lot of communication and signaling between the plant and its root microbiome. And when it comes to fungi, they're attached on the outside and even on the inside of a plant root by one end of their fungal body. The other one is out over here, prospecting in the soil for things that the plant's roots can't reach. They're too far away. And so fungi will fetch, I call them our fetching fungi, and they will bring phosphorus back. That's also one of the three main nutrients that plants need. It will also bring some of these other essential minerals. David mentioned zinc, that's another thing. So what you basically have in this biological bazaar is it's, it's an intense exchange of, of physical goods, of information, and communication. And this is, this is really the grand health plan for the botanical world. Because long before there were agrochemical companies, farmers or gardeners, all the botanical world had was its microbiome. All it had was all of this communication and signaling that happens with um, the microbes in the soil. Just to give you an up close, here's a picture of our uh, fetching fungi running there through a soil particle, fetching things, transporting them back to the plant in exchange for exudates. Okay, so really what this all amounts to is plant intelligence, right? We often think we're so self-centered. Oh, the brain is on top of the body. We look at a plant and we see all the, all the glorious growth and flowers and so forth above ground and we think, oh, the roots kind of blot. Oh, no, 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 no. We need to get that concept out of our minds. The root system kind of is a dual of both gut and brain for the botanical world. And so when Dave talked about soil life diet or fertilizer diet, a fertilizer diet, as you might imagine, is constantly interfering with all of the signaling and communication between the plant and its microbiome. And it messes up this intelligence. And that, that in a nutshell, is sort of the whole problem with having a very agrochemical intense uh, farm, or for that matter, an agrochemical intense garden or any kind of landscape, right? These plants had it figured out a long, long time ago about how to grow and how to stay healthy. And so it might behoove us to think about a plant's green body as something that knows what to do already, but we just need to support it and sort of get out of the way at times. Okay, so not only plants have a microbiome, but every living organism on this planet. And this is, the point of this is not to memorize, please, any of this slide. The point is, this is a farm and all of these organisms, the plants and the animals, all have a microbiome. And if the plant microbiome is doing all of those things that I just talked about, what is going on with other microbiomes? And that's where it comes to us, to the human microbiome, because we too, have a microbiome. And what I want to tell you is that on the whole, our microbiome 
when it's functioning properly, is far, far more beneficial than it is harmful. And here's a, a few quick factoids to ground you in a couple of things. In terms of the cells, our microbial cells that are part of our human microbiome, and our own bodily cells, the ratio is about somewhere around three microbial cells to every one human cell. In other words, there's more of us than them. And also, when it comes to genes, just the bacterial members of the human microbiome, it's estimated, are adding about two million genes to our genome. We have on our own, what we each got from our mom and our dad, uh, a genome that's, that's estimated to be around 23,000 genes. So 23,000 is a lot less than two million. You add in fungi, virus, archaea, all of the other members of the human microbiome, and it's estimated that the, the total microbial number of genes in our bodies is somewhere around four to six million. Okay, that's a lot. It's kind of creepy, a little bit maybe. It's kind of cool if you're a biologist, if you're into your gut, if you're into the microbiome, because all of this has a good deal to do with our health. And that's what the next part of this is going to be about. And I'm going to take you to a place that I never thought I would be up in a talk telling people, we're going to go deep. We're going to go to the bottom, the bottom of the digestive tract, and that would be the colon. Okay, so I want to just quickly place us. Not talking about the stomach, not talking about those sausage-looking loops that you often see in diagrams. That's the small intestine. I'm talking about the colon. It's about the lower five feet of the digestive tract. And this is just a three-dimensional uh, image here. And you can see, obviously, the colon has a central opening. That's called the lumen, a nice thick layer of, of uh, mucus there. A lot of the human microbiome is hunkered down there in the mucus. That's where it lives. And interesting factoid about our colon, most of our microbiome is not in our brain or on our skin or in between our toes. It is in the colon, the lion's share of the microbiome. That is where all of these critters live. This is your onboard ecosystem. The other interesting thing about the colon is that most of our immune system, estimated somewhere around 70 or 80 percent of our immune system and tissue, is associating with the digestive tract mostly around the colon. So this is very, very interesting. And the rest of these next three or four slides, I'm going to show you what is going on here. Okay, so. This is just a cross-section through the colon. What we have, this is the inside of the colon. This is the outside of the colon, OK? And you're, you have cells lining the colon, one cell thick, OK? That's not much, but there is a lot of stuff happening in there. So inside the colon, you've got that mucus layer. You've got members of your microbiome. You've got food particles. You've got pathogens. That's where all of that stuff is. Down here. Just on the outside of the colon wall is a kind of an immune cell called a dendritic cell. And you've been looking at this picture. You can see what's going on here. These dendritic cells are really cool, I think. OK, here's what they're doing. They're, so, they're, they're, they're sort of shapeshifters. And they can squeeze an arm in between your two colon cells. Maybe they're doing that now in some of us, maybe. All right? and it's. That dendritic cell is going to catch a little sample. It's going to get a molecular sample from that member of the microbiome, and it's going to come back down out of the colon, and it's going to show that molecular sample to some pals of it. We've all heard of T cells. I'm sure someone else in this conference has been talking about T cells. It's another part of the immune system. T cells do a number of different things. There's a bit, about a dozen different types or so. I want to talk about the T cells that are involved in inflammation. Because you have some kinds of T cells, when they get the right molecular sample from this dendritic cell, they will activate. And they activate into either a pro-inflammatory T cell, which is to say it revs up inflammation. Now, inflammation, I think, gets kind of a bad rap these days, mostly because it's going on for too long or too much in our bodies. But when things are healthy, when things are functioning normally, 
Inflammation is a good thing. This is what kills abnormal cells and cancer cells. This is what, say somebody picked up a bug at this conference. Your immune system is going to kick up the inflammatory process, and it's going to get that pathogen out of your body. But as soon as that work is done, inflammation is a very, very intense and hardworking process. And so when it's done, you want it to be finished, and you want the anti-inflammatory kind of T cell to move in and say, OK, everything's taken care of. Let's get back at an even keel, and let's go about our day. And so what we're learning about the microbiome, I think maybe you're already putting this together in some sense, is that these dendritic cells communicating with the microbiome, activating either pro-inflammatory T cells or anti-inflammatory T cells. And this is an entirely different way to look at the microbial world. It's a different way to look at our immune system. Our immune system is really reliant on our microbiome in many ways for information about what's happening in the colon, what's happening in the body, what's happening outside the body. Because our immune system is, is stuck in our body, and so it's communicating and gathering information about what is happening. And this, I think, means that the colon, this little place that we never like to talk about, our colons are really not an onboard garbage can. That idea is garbage, OK? Our colons, properly working, the microbiome properly fed, and I'll get into that in a little bit, is really an onboard medicine chest. That is really what is going on, OK? And so you may be wondering, um, it's almost 2020, and how did we miss how did we miss this? How did we miss the fact that microbiome and immune cells are in this sort of hand in glove relationship? It's a very symbiotic relationship. How did we miss this? There's a good reason. There's a good reason because when you look back in history, this is some of the earliest epidemiological work and where that red circle is up there. This is um, all of the things that killed people in the city of London in six, the year 1664 for a one-year time period. And plague is circled up there, and it killed a little over 7,000 people. The plague is due to a microorganism. And so we began to, to, to see, not in 1664, it would be another 200 years before we really connected up certain species of microbes with infectious disease. And so one by one, you know, we learned about cholera as a virus, tuberculosis as a bacterium, polio as a virus. We painted the entire microbial world with the pathogen brush. And that, my friends, has led us very, very astray for quite a long time up until now. And what has, what, what has been um, sort of the consequences of this? Let's fast forward. And that graph on your left shows various kinds of infectious diseases that in the post-war years started to come down. We've greatly controlled, in the Western world anyway, most um, infectious diseases, or we have entirely eradicated them. But something odd was also happening. And, and why are these diseases you know, coming down? Why these steep descent? Clean water has probably done more than anything to curb infectious disease. Um, vaccines do have their place. This has helped a lot with certain um, diseases, as have antibiotics. Antibiotics saved my grandmother of dying from tuberculosis, for example. I imagine others in here, their parents or grandparents, if you were in that time period, that saved a lot of lives. But at the same time, you can see this graph on the right. These are the so-called chronic diseases, or in other words, there's not an infectious pathogen um, behind, say, multiple sclerosis, or Crohn's, or many of the, um, the gut disorders, diabetes, and so on. The list, though, is long on the chronic diseases that are taking most of us out these days, or at least reducing, reducing our lifespan or our quality of life. And it spans these things listed up here and, and even more. So why, why is this happening? 
sort of the, the hypothesis among microbiome research is, is this. Are we possibly missing some of our microbes? Right? Think about that communication between gut microbiota and immune cells. What if we're missing some of our microbes and our immune cells are not getting information or signals that regulates many, many things um, in our body from um, our mood to how we deal with pathogens to various sorts of various aspects of our metabolism and biochemistry. So I, I, I don't want to go into all of the reasons that we might be missing our microbes, but I want to, I'm sure everyone in this room can figure out why antibiotics, overuse and inappropriate use of antibiotics, why the microbiome is going to take a hit. They kill off microbes. That's what they're supposed to do. But there's another factor with our microbiome that you may not have thought of, and that is what we're sending down the hatch. And this is our diet. And the reason I have this up here is that um, when, when it comes to our diet and our digestive tract, as I said, most of the microbiome oops, is down here in the colon. And you really need to take to heart this inner ecosystem that you've got. These organisms need to eat every day just like you do. And they cannot get up out of your body and go over and have quinoa salad. Okay? They are stuck inside of you and they rely on what you eat. And your microbiota will eat anything. They will eat plant foods, they will eat animal foods. And the byproducts that they excrete in your colon are very different depending on the proportion of plant foods and animal foods that you are eating. I, I want you to focus on the two largest arrows on this diagram. The problem with the Western diet, which is, as we know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of meat protein, it's a lot of sugars, not very healthy fats, and that feeds the brain. The brain likes all of that stuff. But the microbiome doesn't really. And, and I'll, I'll show you how all that process is in just a second. But look at what's going on down here in the gut health diet. What it's telling us is to sort of minimize the amount of simple carbs that you have. There's more in the hidden half about these harmful metabolites and why this arrow is bigger over here under the Western diet. But look at this, look at this large, large arrow. When you eat an abundance of plant foods, and I'm not saying only plant foods, but an abundance, half of your plate, half of your bowl, plant foods. The microbiota get a hold of that, they continue to feed on it, and they are producing beneficial metabolites that remain not only in the colon, but they can travel, go through the colon wall, into the bloodstream, and off they go to another part of your body. And this leads me to another question then. So our microbiota consuming all of these plant foods in our colon, and we have all seen this phrase, you are what you eat. Well, let's just explore that, because I want to impress upon you that there's more to it than just that. And it starts with this. There's about some three, 300,000 plant species are estimated overall on the planet. I believe that's the number. We only consume about 200 in our diet through the kinds of, of plants that we grow in agriculture. So while, it, while it, it is true that we used to eat a wider variety of plant species, 200 is still not bad if you can access all of them. And the reason I bring this up is that Bacteroides theta iota omicron, please do not say that. We're just going to call that B theta. That's the microbe, that's the bacterium I'm going to talk about. B theta has a genome, as you can see up here, that encodes about 300 enzymes capable of breaking down plant foods. The reason B theta can do that and we can't is that our paltry 23,000 genes, we do not our bodies do not make the enzymes to totally break down plant foods. And so 
they sail through our digestive tract and they land in the colon there in front of the microbiota and it's pretty much tranquil grazing pastures because B theta and all of the pals that B theta hangs out with down there in the colon they're consuming and finishing the digestion of these plant foods and that's where many of these beneficial microbial metabolites come from either Either these microbes can turn a plant food into one of these beneficial metabolites or the bacterium can produce it on its own. And why would we do this? Why would the human body be farming out this very important task of breaking down plant foods? Well, because long ago, we acquired our microbiomes long, long ago. And as soon as the microbes got into our bodies, through the water we drank through, out of rivers and streams, um, through, imagine digging up a tuber and it's co covered with soil and soil organisms. It's pretty safe in our body compared to the nature out there if you're a little tiny one-celled organism. So they feed us and we feed them. And that's part of the story of B theta. And that's what I just went over. So, I want to talk about um, short-chain fatty acids because they're one of the most common kinds of microbial metabolites. These are beneficial metabolites up here. The point again, don't memorize everything. Here's, here's B theta up there with Bacteroides, all of its other Bacteroides species. These are the names of these different short-chain fatty acids. You can um, find lots of literature on these short-chain fatty acids and what they do in the human body. And these are some of the things. Again, please don't memorize this. I'll just highlight one of these. I talked a little bit about inflammation and what we know about butyrate and propionate, these microbial metabolites, is that they activate what's called a regulatory T cell. That's the kind of T cell that dampens and quells inflammation. So this is how we can control inflammation in our bodies is by feeding the members of the microbiome that churn out the metabolites that communicate with the immune cells that are the anti-inflammatory cells. And the summary on this slide is this. Your microbiome is creating, manufacturing these metabolites does all of these things, keeping pathogens at bay, protection against cancer, and so on. I don't know about you, but when I see these lists of things, this is what it adds up to. This is much of our physical and mental well-being, right? So just like the botanical world, long before there were pharmaceutical companies, even long before there were supplement companies, what we had was the microbiome in our gut, the plant foods that were a part of our diet, and you put those two things together, and that is nature's intelligence enveloped within our bodies. I think that's pretty darn neat, actually. It's also miraculous how well this works. And it's also um, troubling how easily we can mess it up. So when it comes to the microbiome, I usually say, I usually talk about, um, let's talk about protection of the microbiome first and foremost from the moment somebody is born. And if your microbiome has taken a hit, let's talk about restoration. And whether your microbiome is pristine or it's taken a hit, by all means, you have got to be cultivating your onboard medicine chest, which is your, also your inner ecosystem, right? So you can take all the probiotics you want, but if they're not, you're not feeding them, in they go and out they go. And that's also why I like to think about the populations in our gut as really that's what you want to nurture and support. Sure, we need probiotics at times, and there's, there's more research being done on how they can be paired with antibiotics, because when you're taking antibiotics, you're knocking out some of your microbiome. All right, so you're my, these are your personal alchemists. It's not just short-chain fatty acids. This. These are all of the different kinds of metabolites that have been discovered so far that are coming out of the human microbiome. 
And the upshot here is this. About 40% of the molecules and compounds in my body, circulating through my body right now in yours, they were not made by my human cells, not by a liver cell or a kidney cell. They were made by a member of your microbiome. That's right. And so all of a sudden, for Dave and I, we thought, why didn't anybody ever tell us this? Why did no doctor ever tell us about these connections between diet, and microbiome and your immune system. And partly to be fair, this is very new science, right? Somebody who's been out of medical school even for 10 years probably is not aware of all of this. And we're still a long way from getting um, microbiome um, science and research translated into a standard of care. So for that, for that reason, I think it's coming, but it's gonna be a while. But just always be thinking of what am I feeding my microbiome. So really that adage needs to go like this. We and our crops, and if you eat animals, we and our crops and those animals are what our respective microbiomes eat. So the next time someone says, hey, you are what you eat, you have to say, oh, no, 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 no. You're what your microbiome eats. Just remember that, okay? All right, and so, um, The root and the gut, as it turns out, these are very analogous systems. Maybe some of you have already been thinking about that. All of the nutrient acquisition and the processing that goes on by a plant's roots and in the human gut, I've been nattering up here at you about microbial metabolites. This is absolutely key when it comes to the root and the gut. Because what the feedstock is, so. The feedstock is your diet, if you're a person. If you're a plant, the feedstock is what kinds of organic matter, or hopefully the feedstock is not mostly chemicals. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about nutrients and the microbial metabol metabolites that get churned out of what um, the root and the gut are eating. And all of this adds up hugely to immunity and defense, whether you're talking the green body of a plant or a human body. And I think when you put all of these three things together, what we're really talking about is biological intelligence. It's how our bodies evolved, it's how a plant's body evolved, and it's, it's intricate and it's complicated and it's there for a reason because when it is working and working well, we are happy, we're healthy, crop so much as a plant can be happy and healthy if they could tell us, I think that they might. So these are the, the really significant parallels between the root and the gut. And if you even, these words up at the top, inside out, that means that if you were to take a plant root and turn it inside out and put all those little tiny root hairs on the inside, that's a rough facsimile of the human digestive tract, right? It's increasing all of the absorptive surface area. It's where all the signaling and communication is going on. All right. So, long talk, lots of information here, microbes. I hope that David and I have brought the soil to life for you. I hope you understand more about the microbiome. And so later tonight, maybe, someone says, hey, yeah, how was that real truth about health conference? And you're like, so much information, especially like this root gut thing, and oh my gosh. And then you, I've boiled it down to six words. So. All you need to tell them is this, mulch your soil inside and out. All right. Okay. I thank you for your attention. And we have books over here. David and I are here for a little while before we need to get off to the next event in about a half an hour or so. So happy to sign books, happy to uh, answer more of your questions. Thank you again.